In 1630, Puritan colonists from England founded Boston, which became a political, commercial, financial hub of New England region. Everything was somewhat peaceful for the colonists, aside from the French and Indian War. For over a hundred years, the colonists were living their humble lifestyles as the first generations building the new world. on this beautiful morning as we walk on the cobblestone streets of Boston. This city has literally seen it all from the American Revolution and on. Today my focus is going to be on the American Revolution and how it all came to be, how it all started and how this country came to be, this phenomenal country. And I want you to come walk with me. We're going to walk in the footsteps of the American revolutionaries. And uh, I've always been fascinated by the American Revolution. I think it's because my dad always watched the History Channel when I was good and without all of the reality TV stuff. Or maybe it was because I watched The Patriot a little too many times with Heath Ledger in the movie when I was a kid. I just love that movie. So follow me as we walk in the footsteps of our revolutionaries. Custom house, the old custom house of the 1700s of the 13 colonies, the first custom house in Boston. And this is the famous spot where the Boston Massacre happened. So the Boston Massacre is where um, the colonists were taunting the British soldiers. The British soldiers arrived to try to keep the colonists in check uh, because they weren't paying their taxes. So they had to come here and so the colonists were taunting them by throwing snowballs in their faces and one thing led to another. A shot was fired and five colonists, citizens of Boston, died on March 5th 1770 and uh, we're standing in the exact spot this happened. It was a very traumatic moment for the colonies. Uh, Paul Revere actually had done an engraving of the event uh, that took place and I don't know about you but I saw this engraving in my school books to this day. That propaganda has lasted. So it was very um, engraving in, in a little kid's head, you know, of learning about the Boston Massacre. Now that happened in this very spot. The British troops who killed the citizens in the streets were put on trial for murder. Ironically, John Adams volunteered to represent the British in court. John Adams risked everything but he believed that they deserved a fair trial and was very concerned with human rights as a patriot of the new world. John Adams helped the soldiers receive an acquittal for seven of the soldiers and a light sentence for the other two. The crisis was resolved and John Adams was not branded as a traitor in the eyes of the patriots. So the British started to impose a series of taxation onto the colonies because they accumulated an enormous amount of, of debt because of the French and Indian War. And so somehow they needed to pay off that debt. And what better way to do that was with the colonists, the colonies, to tax the colonies. The first tax was the Stamp Tax Act. 
And that started, I believe, in 1763, and so, or 65, I don't know. But anyways, I'm standing out front of the South Meeting House in Boston, Massachusetts, and this is where the revolutionaries would meet to talk about what they were going to do next. They revolted, the Stamp Act was taken out, and act after act, same thing happened. They would revolt, they would take it out, but not one, and it was the Tea Act. And they didn't take away the tea tax, and we all know what happened next, but uh, the revolutionaries, they met uh, in this very building to talk about how they were going to dress up in their disguise as Indians as they throw the tea overboard into the Atlantic Ocean. It's fascinating. Join or die. This is a well-known Sons of Liberty rhetoric. And let's not forget about Samuel Adams, the beer guy, was known for a big leader of the movement and was widely known as a major provocateur. Subsequently, taxes repealed every time except for one act, and that was the Tea Act. It was an added three penny tax on tea salt, which was the preferred drink of that time. On December 16th, 1773, about 15 men from the Sons of Liberty came aboard a ship uh, in the Boston Bay, a merchant ship from Britain, full of tea crates, basically, tea crates, just full. And these guys, literally, they were dressed up like Indians with feathers in their hair, and they threw over all the crates, um, about 342 crates of tea overboard into the Atlantic Ocean. And it was roughly about 10,000 pounds at the time. It was, it was crazy. They were just tired of the tea uh, tax. It was about three pennies um, per tea. Uh, it was too much. It was just too much. So they were they had enough and they wanted to send a message back to Britain by throwing these these crates of tea overboard. But anyways, I'm gonna pass along my tea to you. Take a sip. Pinky out. Pinky out. England sent 3,000 new troops to reoccupy Boston streets, and the Crown of England decides to no longer allow citizens of Boston, Massachusetts to hold any simile of any sort. The tension between the British troops and the citizens of Boston became unbearable. We're in the heart of downtown Boston. There's a lot of old buildings everywhere, but the one that I'm standing in front of is the birthplace of Benjamin Franklin. This building wasn't here when he was born, but this is the actual place where he was born. There was an old house that was right there. So now all we have left is this beautiful sign with his bust on it indicates that he was born here. Benjamin Franklin was very famous for his era at the age of 59. He was bouncing back and forth between Boston, Philadelphia, and London, all over the place. He was an entrepreneur, really well known for his kite experiment with electricity, whatever, get capturing electricity with a kite. So it was very fascinating to be in the same spot that he walked around and, and thought and, and conceptualized ideas of his time.
Freedom is not a gift bestowed upon us by other men, but a right that belongs to us by the laws of God and nature. Benjamin Franklin. The British are coming. The British are coming. Oh my God, the British are coming. We are standing outside of Paul Revere's house. He was a blacksmith. I believe, and he worked a lot with silver. He was a well-known patriot of the colony, uh, and he was a Bostonite. Like he was so patriotic. Like if you could think of any patriot, this is the guy. Like Paul Revere, right? The guy who rode around on a horse and yelled, "The British are coming!" At, at the top of his lungs. I imagine. That night, he was hoarse <laughs> after yelling, the British are coming the whole time. Uh, I would be. I always lose my voice when I raise it. Um, but anyways, so this house has been here for a long, long time, hundreds of years. And it reminds me of those old Salem, old timey Salem homes. Uh, as you can see, it's a cobblestone street they left it cobblestone in front of this old house and in this neighborhood it's beautiful and i highly recommend checking out this area a lot of history but paul revere is well known for his patriotic acts the militia decides to gather and meet the british on their way to Lexington. The British general ordered the militia to disperse. They decided to disperse, but then there was a gunshot. To this day, no one knows who shot the first shot. And then out of fear, the British troops began firing towards the militia. The battle had begun. This was the first battle and really sparked the beginning of the American Revolution. Well, hello. We're in the north end of Boston. This is the old historic side of Boston. It's little Italy, if you will. And right to your left is Paul Revere's house. Uh, right behind you is the Sacred Heart Italian Church. And uh, I just love these old buildings because take a look, these buildings, they look like it's old copper or maybe they're painted that way. But that's what happens to copper when it is left in the rain. So take a look around at the Gaslight District. It's not really Gaslight District. We're not in San Diego, but hey, this is the North End. The American Revolution lasted from April 19, 1775 to September 3rd, 1783. The infinite voices of freedom echo through the streets of Boston. You can feel it pulsating through the air. Years later, the Constitution was created in September 1787 in Philadelphia, a document that we treasure to this very day. It is a roadmap to guide us into the future, 
Of course, our forefathers could not have fathomed the technological advantages we have or anticipated the political issues of this time. But at the very core of this Constitution document are the foundations of moral values we still hold up to, regardless of the party line. We live in very different times nowadays, and it is unfair of us to impose our new values of today on times of the past. The past wasn't perfect, but we can all agree it was a different time and a different standard of life, and they had their own sets of struggles. During this time, life was mostly about survival and trying to put food on the table. Men hoped to have a valuable skill, a trait that would help their society move forward while sustaining a sustainable life for their families. Our founding fathers were intelligent men with an immense amount of fortitude and had seen hard times strife and persevered against the British. With this, I take deep pride and gratitude for the acts of courage to stand up for the true justice and moral values.